Well, with that, welcome to Over 50 Starting Over, everyone. I'm Barry Edwards. And I'm Merle Garrison. On this beautiful Friday. Uh, how, how'd your week go? Mine was long. Uh, long. Uh, you know what? There's been, it's been jam-packed, but uh, you know, a lot of times when it's jam-packed, it goes fast. So for me, it's been a, a pretty quick week. Yeah, you and it's hard to believe it's the weekend already. Well, you know, you had a lot of things you keep mentioning over the last few weeks that you've seen a lot of activity start to bubble up, that uh, people are seeming more positive and are starting to make some moves. So uh, you are getting busy, uh, yeah, putting, the, getting things down the pipeline, right? Things are things are starting to happen, which is great. I'm feeling really good about that. Lots of activity. You know, we've got. Uh, we got a lot of work to do, but it seems like the clouds are starting to part. Yeah. And I'm keeping my fingers crossed on that. Well, that makes me want to ask you, and I, I got an article that I wrote here that I want to share, so I don't want to get too far away from that in our career upfront section. But this does tie in. There's so much going on right now with the COVID thing. Are we starting to break through that? Or, you know, what's going on? We had Dwayne, you know, announce his big press conference on this thing a couple of days ago. And that was a real downer. It was just really, like, hey, just he just uh, reiterated what the CDC said. Oh, you can uh, don't worry about wearing masks outside. You can go without if you're vaccinated and if there's no one around you and blah, blah, blah. It was um, rather uneventful. So I'm wondering if California, if there's any news on that kind of front. Well, you know, first off, we have a confirmation that our governor has been recalled. So that's actually going to happen. This has everything to do with the mask restrictions and really sure. all the restrictions that we've had here has everything to do with that. As you remember, our governor having a meal with the health commissioners sure. without a mask on all up on each other. Um, the height of uh, in the very high. Yeah, the, the very high. Yeah, yeah. When everything was completely locked down in yeah. California, we couldn't even, I couldn't even go outside for yeah. a bicycle ride. That was like within days of Nancy getting her hair done. Yes, <laughs> exactly. That was, that was all back then. And so this, so our governor's in a recall now. And it, does that mean, what is it? Does that mean like he's standing trial or does no, that mean no. he's really getting on seated? No, n neither. Uh, what it means is that there's going to be an election in October. And it's really interesting how this works. Not a whole lot of states work this way with their constitution. But in this particular case, if 20% of the voting population from the last election votes to recall or sig signs to recall, then it triggers this new election where anybody can run against this governor in this upcoming election. The interesting thing is that the election is going to happen, I think, in September, October. And then if he wins, his term is actually up the following year. So he has to run again. Wow. Uh, yeah. So it's really uh, imagine having to win two elections in a row like that. That's what he's going to be looking at here. Well, you know what? That puts him on the hot seat that he better start listening to the constituents. And, this is uh, exactly doing right. right. So yeah. what we're seeing over here is a lot of things have started to open up. The gyms have opened up. Nice. Uh, have you have you gotten yourself there yet? No, I have not. Uh, my my gym is a very. I was going to a gym that was uh, probably the most. Well, not probably. It was the most expensive gym I'd ever been going to, mm -hmm. and uh, and I was going there for a reason because it's really pleasant to go over yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, it's really nice, but. Uh, you know, I'm not making the kind of, you know, it, the, 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 the whole COVID thing has been a real downer on commissions. So yeah. I'm kind of taking a break from that. I'm doing some other things, uh, riding my bicycle, been going on some great mountain bike rides, but let me, let me back up to go to the, the main point here, which is what's happening in California. Things are starting to open up as a result. We're seeing that happen. We heard the CDC announcement, or at least I heard the CDC announcement earlier this week about masks outside. And so I thought what would happen is people would stop wearing masks outside when they're walking around. <laughs> I was wrong about that. Yeah, I could have <laughs> predicted this one. <laughs> so, I mean, I'm walking around without a mask outside. And uh, it's funny, I was watching this Tucker Carlson episode and he was, he was real mad about this whole thing. And he said, look, 
this is actually the day before the CDC announced this. And he was saying, look, the evidence is very clear. You, you don't, the mask is doing nothing outside for you. The evidence is there. The science is there. Science. This is what the scientists are saying. You, you, if you're outside and you're not wearing a mask and you see somebody wearing a mask, rather than feel like, oh my gosh, I should be wearing a mask. Uh, and and I'm making everyone uncomfortable. Really, you are the one that should be going up to them and saying, "Hey, can you take off your mask? You're making me very uncomfortable." <laughs> so, so when the CDC announced that the next day, I went for a walk because every day I go for a walk and everyone's wearing masks, and I, I just don't look at them. I just look over here. Sure. <laughs> you know? But so in, in time, I'm like. Yeah, I'm so they can't give time. you that look. They want to intimidate you with, no, they're going to have to come up to you or actually yeah. they're going to have to be more brazen about it. Right. Then there's a real problem announced, you know? Now, I feel the same way you do. That 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 really bothers me. People have gotten their heels so dug in with their yeah. politics on it or just, man, there's a lot of people like feeling like the moral authority. And well, you know, Barry. gives them a chance to do it. it th this, this is true. And I think there's something else going on, though, too. Mm -hmm. I think that over the last year, we've had something unprecedented happen. And I say unprecedented. Oh, that that yeah. word is just doesn't even. Just, in our lifetime. This is, in, in all of world history, nothing like this has ever <laughs> happened. We've never, never had it where the whole world had to be, you know, isolated. We've never seen it before. It's just never happened. And so now we've been on this sort of lockdown for a year. And what I'm seeing is that it's now caused a little bit of a phobia. And the oh, phobia is. is that that people are afraid of each other. And so people that are um, that have been vaccinated are wearing masks and still and some of them out here are wearing two masks. <laughs> I, I, I have a friend of mine that came over who and him and his wife were vaccinated like a couple of weeks ago, had their second shots. Uh, but they came over and they were wearing two masks, <laughs> each of them. <laughs> I thought, well, gosh, well, what? I, I, I saw um, the uh, president giving his speech on Wednesday, I guess it was, and he had the vice president, oh. the speaker of the house behind him, and they were yeah. both wearing masks. And I Theater. thought, boy, that was surreal looking. We'll and, get back to that. Yeah. That'll be in our but, current events, because I actually is, have notes on that. But this goes back to business. And when we get that kind of visual signal from our leaders, just like you talked about Mike DeWine, that has an impact on business. And mm. should we open up? Should we be more lenient? Should How should we act? Is it safe? This sends a clear message that it's not safe or there should be something to be concerned about. And I just feel like that's a that's a terrible thing for business. Well, I agree. But more importantly, the Cleveland Browns just picked their first draft pick. That, that's more important. <laughs> <laughs> and this is still intro stuff. I want to go into this article that I wrote that I'm excited about sharing. But um, yeah, so the draft started this weekend. And yeah. like when they interviewed, so they picked, uh, they had the 26 pick, not used right. to being right. that far down. Yeah, yeah. But that's what you got. That's what you get, but yeah. they have nine picks, nine. So I was hoping they would package a couple up, make a deal and move up and get the oh, best yeah. cornerback in the draft. But I trust in the, the powers that be there. They took a cornerback at 26 and I read up on them and stuff. I'm really excited about this because they needed a more short up there. They got a cornerback in free agency because our corners, we have two like should be all pro corners, but they're always injured or often injured. Mm -hmm. So now we got these two more stud corners and uh, it, that's really exciting. We uh, really plug some holes in free agency. So as the coach and the, um, the GM were interviewed, I saw this this morning. They're like, yeah, it's uh first time that we've had a draft where it's about luxury picks, basically don't need mm. a quarterback. Don't need a star running back. Don't, you know, it's just uh, adding depth to key positions. That's so exciting. Well, that never happens for the Browns. I, no. That never happened when I was following them. 
Right. So it's Super Bowl or bust this year, uh, in my opinion, because these days you have such a small window before the salary, you know, before these rookie contracts come up, salary cap becomes uh, a bigger issue. So I think this is they better. I think they're looking at it like this is the year that we got to make that run for the Super Bowl. So I'd love to see you guys uh, do that. I say you guys like you're going to do it with them. Yeah, I'll be out <laughs> there luck, Barry. with the water bottle. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> well, you'll do your part in, in cheering for them. So it's it's exciting uh, for the city. Yeah, and, I, uh, I, I agree. Speaking of that, having happy hour with Irby this afternoon. Oh, are you really? Yeah, um, I haven't seen him since the podcast. So looking forward to catching up with him. That is outstanding. Boy, we sure have gotten a lot of good feedback from that show, Barry. You got some to share? You had asked me to uh, put together some of the stuff that uh, that I had gotten, and I forgot to do that. But... I have I have two of them that okay. you sent me. Go ahead. Well, I got to find them. So this is, I got very I have something moving. queued up right here. Yeah, people were very moved by Irby's story, by the courage that he had to come out and just be willing to talk about this very freely. We were able to ask him some very personal questions, which he had no problem responding to. But boy, we had a hard time getting through that emotionally. I know um, yeah, I was, was having tough. a hard time with that. But Do you uh, want me to read one? yeah go right ahead yeah okay this is from one of your co-workers um let's see have to tell you i listened to you, your irby greenwood podcast this morning after john had already m- mentioned it yesterday wow what a heartbreaking story and someone like irby who was beyond transparent in his challenges and strength he continues to build appreciate you sharing such voices reminder to all of us what is important in life that is outstanding. I've got another one here. Well, uh, wait, this one goes with it, though. Oh, okay. Okay, ahead. so John, he referenced John. That is your boss. John John Wax is your... Uh, oh, he yes. says my boss. He says, uh, well, I guess that's you. My boss brought it up in our sales meeting yesterday and told the team that whatever we are dealing with now is nothing compared to what Irby is dealing with. Yeah, that, you know... That one, yeah. It's really something that first off, I mean, my boss watches the podcast, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, but, but, you know, I mean, this is a, our, our podcast really permeates every area of my life and uh, uh, people are seeing what we're doing here and it's having a, an impact on them and it's having an impact on not just, I mean, the subject that Irby was talking about it was dealing with him and his loss of his son, but everyone can relate to this in one way or another. And uh, it really touched a lot of people's hearts. I've got uh, another one here from my friend Megan, who said, yeah, Irby made me cry a little. Such a sad story to hear. It hits me harder, I think, because being a trauma RN in uh, in the ED, emergency department, I saw so many people like his son, lots died. We only see the family briefly, but don't see the long-term effects. It breaks my heart. We honestly, purposely don't think about that. This made me see his side. Bless that sweet man. Oh my God, that is awesome. And uh, I said, uh, he is a very sweet man. Again, I just have, um, let's see here. He says, uh, uh, or that was a very tough interview. We had to stop several times. Oh, oh let me just get down to this. I, I sent her back what he had said to me when I reached out to him, which I thought was really awesome. And he said, uh, thank you for your kind words and prayers and for having me on the, as a guest. I received numerous and positive feedback from plenty of people. Tejan's mom, Tejan's mom was very happy with the interview and your statement about me seeing my my hootie again <clears throat> and pootie I think that's, that's his nickname cool. right, right right yeah yeah i have another one here but that i'm i'm gonna look for that i thought was really good and let me see if i could pull that up really quickly here but um my uh, another actually this is my uh, my sister-in-law she says merle i just listened to the interview with irby i can't even imagine what he's going through uh, your parting words to him were so powerful and beautiful. I pray that they reach his heart and that that he garners strength from them. 
<clears throat> so there's a lot of people just they their hearts were touched they had they felt a compassion for Irby and what he's going through and you know but I I just go back to what uh, John Wax uh, the person I work for said is you know whatever you're going through when you listen to something like that and you see this man you know courageously moving through this whole process and and being very humble and just saying how, how much his heart is broken but still moving forward it's right. inspiring to us all and uh i'm really thankful that that uh we were able to have him on the show and um what a great person to have as a friend barry oh i can't wait to see you guys today. have so yeah. anyhow i tell them thanks from me and also from uh, the audience of the show we all appreciate them yeah I'd just like to mention if you guys leave that under per the comment perhaps on either our website over 50 starting over.com where we have the posts uh, of every show or most of you are either watching it on uh, the YouTube channel where you can leave the comment there or share it so that uh, someone like Irby could respond to it and see it himself. Or if you're listening to the podcast, you could just come over to the YouTube channel or website and show it. But anyways, what I wanted to share right now, there's a lot of information right here. I think it's really good is an article I wrote. This was inspired by my uh, business partner, Susan. And, um, she said that I should write something directed right at CEOs, business owners, marketing managers, that is really definitive of, uh, it's like marketing, online marketing 101. And I call it how to expect ROI from your online marketing efforts. And by ROI, I mean, return on investments. Do you see it, Merle, the article? I switched views. Yes, I do. Okay. Okay. So again, CEOs, business owners expect ROI from your online marketing efforts. This is at edwardscom.net. Scroll to the bottom. You will see the article. I will leave the note, uh, the, the link in the show notes, but just a quick overview of what this is. This, I always have a policy of no geek speak. So I try to put things in the simplest words possible, but there's so many people and I meet these people when I have interviews with uh, get referred to a new client, they are always in a state of either. Uh, well, I won't see these people, but I have this listed out uh, denial people there in a state of denial, the internet's a fad, I don't want any part of it. And then they'll eventually work their way up to apathetic. I, I realize I'm neglecting this form of marketing someday. I'll get to it. And then it gets to fearful, I'm gonna do it but I don't know how to get started and I'm afraid of wasting money. Uh, and that's, I deal with these people quite a bit. So this is for you guys out there that are, um, that are interested in getting started, but you're afraid you don't know where to start. This is just your ground floor. Uh, and a lot of people like marketing directors get hired and they've been doing things the old fashioned way forever. And they don't, they're in the same situation. Now they're in charge of hiring us, uh, subbing out some marketing, online marketing stuff, and they don't know where to start. The worst thing you can do is just find the cheapest route possible because you could end up creating Google penalties for yourself and creating a bigger problem than uh, you should have. So the point is, is that you should see your new online marketing presence, your online presence, as you either see it as an asset that's going to create return on investment if, it's, if you don't see it that way, then it's a liability. And, and it's going to be a big liability because you're going to go cheap and you're going to create problems for yourself. So uh, this article explains the difference between online marketing and traditional marketing and how you increase your traffic to your website organically meaning non-paid. I'm, I'm a huge advocate of getting your website done correctly with the content correct and the structure intact before you go spending a ton of money on social media ads and Google AdWords. They're very, very expensive. And if you're not ready to convert as many as you possibly can of those, you're wasting a ton of money on a monthly basis. I hate to see that. I'd rather see you get, uh, get started and getting a return on investment organically. 
meaning no further investments. That has to do with um, creating a good content marketing campaign. You're, and now I talk about the difference between a website and your social media channels. Just briefly, a website is your headquarters. Social media channels are kind of like the roads that lead to and from your headquarters. And that's where you want to put out billboards. All right. That's mm. content. That's just mm -hmm. content that you trickle out there. Your website is a forever place. That's where you put your great content that is evergreen, that continues to build your search engine optimization. So you, you get found first up there. Social media posts, they're just fleeting. They're at, like going by a billboard. It's very fleeting, mm -hmm. but it's necessary to advertise on them. So I go through the basic anatomy of a lead generating online presence. It consists of your website, your social media, as I said, your advertising and an email campaign. And that is where you build your list, which is very important. So I talk about all of that and how you have to be super clear on your offers, how you got to create trust and how you build your prospect list. Very, very important. So I then talk about how you improve your search engine ranking results and the fuel for it is quality content. Very, very important. And to do quality content, you need a clear content marketing plan. It makes everything efficient. So this isn't rocket science. It's all right here laid out for you, okay? So your web development is your priority number one that you don't get penalized. If, you, if you're a DIYer, you're probably going to copy content from other people's websites and you're going to get penalized for plagiarism. And it's mm. a severe penalty and you're just wasting your time. Or if you have somebody on the cheap doing that for you, you're wasting your money. So I then take, uh, I just walk you through what I would call a brief look at online marketing 102. And that is sales funnels. I talk about that frequently. It's basically upselling. I talk about bad reviews and reputation management, just real briefly. Then I talk about backlinks. Like I said, I don't like to talk about geek speak and it, whoa, all of a sudden we're talking backlinks and we're on the verge of geek speak. Well, uh, it's very necessary. It's very important to search engine optimization. So I give you an intro to that right there. It's uh, three paragraphs and they're short paragraphs. So don't worry. Then I just tell you what to be aware of scams like being held hostage. These are people that say, I'll create your online presence really cheap. You can find those everywhere, but they own it. They, they own the mm. passwords, everything else. So from then on, you are getting charged like exorbitantly, either monthly or every time you ask for something. Now they have you held hostage. I, by the way, I learned a long time ago, building trust with your clients is worth way more than doing things the wrong way, as in this negative thing of being held hostage. I create a Dropbox for my clients. And as I create social media uh, channels for them, mm -hmm. uh, every, all these different things they have to do with their website. I keep all of those passwords and everything in a note, in a, in a page of notes that is in that Dropbox that they have access to at all times. That so that everything gives else. them the ability to make changes uh, they could if they want. What it gives them is the ability to go somewhere else anytime they want. And use the passwords. Yeah, for if, the... they, if they're like, they don't like what I'm doing, yeah. they can call someone else and say, I got everything right Give here. Them everything you need. Got yeah. it, got it. Yeah, so it's all about trust. And, and I got yep. her in my keep, you know? Yep, yep, yep. And so then I, I'm coming close to the end here. Uh, I talk about how you measure effectiveness to sh ensure that you're getting a return on your investment. Now, this is what, when you're working with somebody, they should be telling you this, okay? But I'm just giving you uh, some knowledge here. This, this is what you should expect. When you get a proposal for somebody to put together your web presence, they should be saying, hey, if you're going to spend six to $8,000, then I expect you to be in the black because of leads coming in. Mm -hmm. uh, you got to figure out how much evaluation is. Like if you're a dentist, a lead may equal about $400 a year per, mm -hmm. per client that you get out of it. Uh, same with like a auto repair shop or something. So then you got to figure out, well, how long, how many leads does it take to get me in the black? And then uh, you know, get me out of the red and into the black and a, a, a decent, a good web. Mm, what would I want to say? Online marketer should be able to put that together for you. 
And so that is all laid out for you. And then you can uh, then from there talk about a phase two about doing a content marketing plan that, okay, so now if you're getting say 10 leads a month in, phase two should be tr to try to double or triple that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's nice. Now you can once again measure when you get in the black and now you're making big money off of your web presence. So that's the bottom line. Don't be penny wise and dollar foolish. Get positive ROI from your lead generation. And that's what I got for you. You know what, Barry? I mean, the, all of this is just um, just great inside baseball for business people to see exactly the power of uh, having an online presence. And, you know, one of the Correctly. things that you had mentioned is that it's more important to do it right uh, than just to go out there and do some stuff and, and reach out there. And so many times I've been interested in a product or a service and somehow I was driven to a website that they had and the website just flopped, uh, just hard to find information, hard to figure out exactly what they do. And here, whatever they invested into that website, they lost on me. And not only that, uh, it, it, it has a psychological effect on the, the person driven to the site is, yeah, why would you ever go back there again? You've no. lost that customer for potential customer for life. Yeah. And so I, I really believe what you're saying, Barry, is such precious information, especially for those people in those first couple of categories you had at the beginning yeah. of your article, which, you know, there's people out there like that. And they just they don't understand the power of what you're talking about, especially today. Yeah. And with what you said right there, you have two seconds to sell. All right. As soon as you get to a website, you're looking for something in particular. So you Google something and you pull up like three to four competitors all up in tabs. That's what most people do. So somebody lands on your, your uh, site and your offerings, you got two seconds to buy another two seconds. So you better put up right in front of their face what you are about, what you are selling, so that you can then set, have them take a look at your services. Now, if they like your services, because they're nice, clean, and uh, easy to read, then they'll go to your about page, because now they're looking for trust. Like, who are right. you? What are you about? And can I trust you? And so it's, it's those kind of things that you need to know in order to do this correctly. And as you said, if you go, to, if you want to go for the lowest uh, price, you are going to have somebody that gives you a bad structure, gives you bad. Con it's so it's so much about content, doing your content right, niching down your services correctly. And everybody's like, oh, but the, I could offer them so much more. I do so much more. Put your three best, biggest things out there that you're an expert on first. And then when you win trust with them, they'll ask you what else you, that you offer. That's very important. Right. People, it's, <laughs> people seem it's, it's kind of like, a, I don't know, a recovery group or something. You can't do it on your own. You know, you, you yeah. need support because <laughs> you're going to put everything out there for sure. Mm. Good stuff, Barry. I love uh, where this is going. I, I got to say, just to tag on to what you're saying, um, I've been studying a, a, a new uh, author here. We, we've talked about several oh. authors, and, yeah. and especially when it comes to um, just business. And uh, this guy's name is Mike Weinberg. Have, have you heard of Mike Weinberg yet? Mm, I don't think so. So he's got a book out called New Sales Simplified. And I, uh, and this is really all about getting new sales and the something we all need. Highly recommend yep. this book, Mike Weinberg. He's a great writer. First off, uh, you can get through his stuff and it's interesting. And a lot of sales uh, books are kind of boring and some of them are highly technical, but this is a person that he's got a podcast out there. So if you get a chance to check him out and you're, you're looking to improve your sales process and, and just get some good tips on cold calling and different ways to do this that make a lot of logical sense and you want to get this book. But I've been focusing on one of his chapters called Sharpening the Sales Story. And what he's talking about is a, uh, a power 
statement and he has this whole thing have you you've heard of an elevator pitch you know it's oh, a, sure. it, you know what you say to somebody on what do you do and you're on the elevator and you you've got this 30 second pitch well he hates that mm -hmm. and he says that uh, look there's very little selling going on in the elevator what you really need is a power statement that you can draw from yeah. and it's very interesting how he puts this together so i actually have been working on a power statement for my own business uh, within spoke and um, I've, I've actually put together a, a statement I've got the I've got the rough draft of it it's actually taken me a little time I'm about two weeks to put this together but now that I have the rough draft put together it is extremely powerful I feel very empowered and confident that I have something very concise out here and here's the main premise Barry and I think this is really important is that he talks about how salespeople come in to talk and they're going to present to you and tell you everything about their company and what yep. they know about the company, how great the product is and this and that and the other. And the customers out there, a prospect is out there thinking, so what? Yep. Um, and so what he has done with this power statement is changed the dynamics so that um, he's got a uh, um, sort of uh, four different steps here that he looks at. I'm, I'm looking at my other computer here with this information. Mm -hmm. So he starts out uh, with a headline about your company. Uh, with a very brief statement about who you are and what type of clientele personnel that you're looking for identify uh, my, the target audience in my case it would be you know healthcare leaders mm -hmm. clinicians physicians uh and then uh, a transitional statement that says people turn to my company when they and then you have uh your, your client, value proposition client issues addressed it's very yeah. important the steps so, so you're going to go to client issues addressed and this is the th these are the things that your your clients are naturally thinking about. These are the things that they're dealing with on an everyday basis. Uh, uh, when they're frustrated that they're not able to get the service that they're looking for in time, that they're desperate to have a, uh, a marketing person that's not going to lead them into, uh, into a depression or, you know, these types of things. So that gets their attention. Then you talk about your offerings. I'm, this is what we do. We, we handle this, we handle that. I do it with this and that and then your differentiators people we dominate the market because we do x y and z better than anybody else nobody else can do this mm -hmm. and it's very important that you keep that that um format of the client issues addressed then your offerings then your differentiators and what that does is it has this effect that i just talked about it gives you confidence but it's a powerful these are are uh, outcome driven messages that get your target contacts attention. And um, what it does is it sets up, it changes the whole dynamic of your relationship to focus on the real value of what you're offering right away. It opens up the, the thinking of that person and lets down the defensiveness because now they understand that you have something that can really help them with what their challenges are on a daily basis. Once you have that power statement, you can use that in so many different ways from cold calling to emails to presentations, and you can mix that into oh, yeah. just to even an elevator conversation going up the elevator. But uh, highly recommend taking a look at this one. It's Mike Weinberg. It's the it's a uh, uh, new sales simplified in the chapter is sharpening the sales story. Oh, that sounds really good. Now, it's really interesting that he just taught you how to write marketing copy, but use it as a sales pitch. That's exactly what that is. When you talked about starting off with, and I like this a lot, starting off with recognizing uh, most customers comply. <laughs> you just hit your microphone with it. It was really loud. And I almost spilled <laughs> coffee all over myself. I wish you would have. <laughs> oh, I would have hey. been so angry. My this Harley was, shirt. <laughs> this is this is our first episode of season four. It would have oh, been a yeah, great way. <laughs> great way to start off with uh, a highlight. We, we would have jinxed our season right there. That's <laughs> funny. Hey, my now, computer fell down. <laughs> now, as a marketer, when I'm trying to get testimonials from people, yeah. what I'm asking them is, what did what was your biggest stumbling block 
before you find, finally said yes? Was it proximity? Was I too far away? Was I this, that, or the other? And how did we overcome that? And that's what you, he, he's got you leading with. Is right. Most customer, that's right. exactly right. So you're speaking right to your basic customer. You're speaking to their needs right away, yeah. rather than how great you are. You're yes. speaking to what they're dealing with. And it's such a more, it's, it's such a more effective way to go. And it's something you can feel very confident about when you talk to people, because now you're, you're them focused and uh, in what they're dealing with. And boy, does yes. that ever open up the conversation. And this goes back to what we were um the, what was the author's name chris voss and oh yeah that was and good just stuff. the the stuff that we were talking about i've been using that ever since where you know oh, it seems yeah. like this mm-hmm. is a very effective way to market to your to your customers barry and then you know it's it's it, it, and when you use these tactics it really focuses on the customer or the client or gets the you out of your head relationship right and out there into their their field right and mm-hmm. and really it's so funny because all of this stuff leads to uh, um, prosperity when it comes to selling, but really as a way of life and focusing on not yourself and on other people leads to so many other benefits in life. It's just the way to go. Right, right. So Merle, I want to segue because whew, time once again is flew by. Yeah. Yeah. Flying by. Um, I, as you know, I told you that I had heard two fantastic Jordan Peterson podcasts this oh. week. And they're so heavy. They're so good that I think we probably should take only one and talk about it. And I'll save another. Uh, So the first one I heard was, is everything better than we think? And his guest is Bjorn Lomborg. And it's on the Jordan Peterson podcast. And it's all about, he talks about how to spend our limited resources more efficiently on our truly biggest problems worldwide. And that's a problem that he talks about right there is most of us don't even care in the whole world. We don't care about worldwide problems because we don't see ourselves in the world. We see ourselves in our, in our country, in our state Mm -hmm. or whatever. But he says worldwide, like really big problems. Well, you got tuberculosis, which isn't talked about much because here in the rich country, we've pretty much eliminated it. But it's a a gigantic worldwide problem. Um, COVID, obviously, infrastructure, poverty, air pollution, climate change. Oh, and AI. And uh, and he says he gets constantly accused of being a a climate change denier because he just talks about the waste of money and the way there's, he's not a denier, but he says that he, they talk about it quite a bit that it is being used in the very typical apocalyptic manner that gets people so full of fear that it works politically. It's an easy sell. Yeah, it's a yeah. political weapon, actually. There you go. There, that's exactly it. Or you could say it's a great easy sell. Um, whereas these other problems, that they're harder and take longer to solve, but they're in the, the dollar, the return on investment is infinitely better. And so here's like, uh, let's let, let me see if my notes here, but he, he said that um, like with climate change, it sucks up billions of dollars inefficiently every year, but three quarters of the world don't even care about it. So if you're talking, you know, the Western uh, uh, societies like us in Canada and stuff like that, we it's all it's all we think about because we have all of our other needs met for the most part. Uh, But he says three quarters of the rest of the world, Africa, India, China, Latin America, they think their best days are still ahead. Whereas we think we're on, oh, the end of the world is in 12 years, basically, if you listen to AOC, but poverty, this is going to blow your mind. Poverty is a number one problem worldwide. And a solution, as he says, is to open up free trade of agriculture because the poorest countries countries do have this ability to trade agriculturally, right, right? but we need to open that up, but we can't unless we subsidize our own farmers, which sounds terrible at face value uh, to you and I, 
But with his studies, what he says he's found is what this is going to be hard to believe, but they talked about it for a long time. One dollar in investment here, meaning subsidizing farmers, can equal two thousand dollars to the poor countries return on investment. One dollar investment gets you two thousand dollars to the poor countries. And um, so bringing people out of poverty allows them to begin to stop worrying so much about their personal problems. And then they could start worrying about worldwide problems, too. And um, I, I just thought it was absolutely mind blowing. Uh, and, and he has like all kinds of other examples that are like this. The point being that we have to prioritize our where we're spending our limited resources so that we're doing it most effectively first. He says like the climate change thing, uh, the models say that we are due to raise in temperature by four degrees Celsius by the end of the century but we're not going to die or burn the planet up or whatever. Um, and, he, what, you know, and he's saying, so what everyone is talking about now is, oh, we need to put more money into our existing green stuff, windmills and solar panels. And he goes, right now, that consists of at most 3% of our electrical output. Okay. He goes, if we could put billions of dollars into it, what are we going to raise it to? Five, six percent? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not effective because if these people are really honestly that concerned about climate change, that it's it's life threatening, as they say, they'd be investing in nuclear power right now, big time, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because that's Boy, yeah, you're making a great point here. In fact, on CyberTalk, we did a whole episode on this and, and you're right. I mean, first off the uh, the amount of money that's spent on the uh, renewable energy being wind and solar yeah um, you know the the we're hearing um, this new administration talking about um, you know going to 100 percent renewable energy at, at by the by 2050 and what what our research has shown is that that's an impossibility currently uh, yes. you, 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 not, not even currently it's just you don't have constant wind you don't have constant solar power look at what happened to texas they have that you had that winter yeah. storm that happened and well solar doesn't work when the, in a snowstorm because <clears throat> it covers up the solar panels and wind uh we saw failed as well and you're right it seems like nuclear nuclear energy is a much more reliable steady form of energy clean energy uh, that's yeah. a, that's available to us and uh, more investment needs to happen in that area if you take a look at the whole texas debacle that happened earlier this year uh it wasn't that we, we there was a failure in wind and solar but then you've got uh, gas and uh, nuclear and unfortunately because these two these systems were disjointed and not uh, not contained together in the same system you had a nuclear failure there as well. <clears throat> that didn't have to happen uh, if these things were more tightly put together. It, it just seems to me that um, uh, you, what Jordan Peterson's making a lot of sense, you know, putting your, all your eggs in that one basket isn't the answer. Having a, a distributed plan, I think, is really the, the way to go and in, in tying these systems together uh, is true. Now, you know, you go and taking a look at these world issues is, um, I think, a, a noble way of looking at the world. And I and I love that. I, I But when you said subsidies, I, I, it made me think about what happened during our Great Depression with our farmers, which really, if you take a look at our history, we're still digging out of this whole w way that we have subsidized our farmers, which which basically has ended up as uh, a lot of food stock here in the United States being destroyed when people are actually starving to death. Um, and, and so that, that part, I believe, could be managed a lot better. But when politicians get involved in this whole thing, corruption is rampant. Yeah, you know, and additionally, first of all, I want to just make a little correction there. This is Bjorn Lomberg's uh books that he wrote that yes i'm familiar with him yeah he was part jordan, of our, our research actually nice yeah jordan peterson's a big fan of his books so he brought them mm -hmm. on the podcast so these are his ideas jordan peterson brought up a really interesting point 
when uh, Lomberg was talking about the $1 in subsidies gets you a $2,000 uh, reward in a third world country, a, a poverty stricken country. Um, Jordan Peterson said that, well, he goes, there's one thing that you got to remember, though. He goes that there's the sales and marketing aspect of it. And every entrepreneurial, uh, what do I want to say? Up to uptake. Endeavor. Endeavor. Yeah. That's the word. Thank you. Uh, will always require about 65 to 85 percent of its funds being targeted into sales and marketing efforts you have to be able to sell it and he goes the problem with this is is it's a hard sell he goes whereas climate climate change you can have a hot summer or a hurricane and it's it's easily digestible into fear for people so that's mm -hmm. an easy sell mm -hmm. which is the problem so when he, uh when Bjorn talks about the one dollar to the two thousand dollar two, yeah, two thousand dollar ratio, uh, Peterson put a lot of uh, reality in there with the sales and marketing effort that would need to happen. Interesting. <clears throat> I really love how Jordan Peterson can look at complex situations. Knows everything. Yeah. How do you? How do you? How your brain is a computer, man. I mean, how, yeah. how do you yeah. do that? Yeah. Uh, but yeah, he's he's an impressive guy. I, I interesting subject and interesting that Bjorn. I mean, come on. How 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 what a, what a coincidence that I was that we were studying that same guy and we actually had quotes from him on our show. Actually, I'm like, get out of here. You're talking about Bjorn. I I can't even say his last name. Yeah, it's. Um, uh Long. I mean, how many how many Bjorns are there out there? You know, Bjorn probably Bjorn. it's like John. It's like probably John in Sweden. Probably, probably. Hey, I up, just man? want to throw out there for now because I did uh, I did text you this that the second podcast that I am on I'm listening to for the second time as of yeah. this morning at yeah, the gym because I needed to. Jeez, uh, Christianity and the Modern World with Bishop Barron. And this guy's genius, man. This guy's yeah. so smart. And it's such an interesting podcast. you got to listen to it. And it talks about so much. Um, and I need to take notes on it because they go from one thing to the other to the other. But and when I look at my notes, it honestly confines me too much. So I'm just going to go from memory. But a lot of what they're talking about <laughs> is the failure today of Christianity and how it's kind of been slipping to the wayside. And a lot of it, there's a few reasons why, but a lot of it is because Christianity uh, churches, well, you know, you could go back to the Catholic churches indiscretions of uh, decades with the priests and stuff, and then the cover up and yeah. all of that. So there, that's very well deserved. But churches in general are not asking enough of their their flock, if you want to call them flock, but of their followers. And they got into a really interesting discussion about how, uh, you know, this is a world of challenges. It's it's nothing but a struggle, this life, and it's meant to be. And well, how can, and people are not accepting the religious uh, point of view of things so much, because why would a God do that? I mean, I'm put forth into all this struggle. He's not helping me. And what is he getting a kick out of watching me struggle? And that's not it at all. It's Jesus Christ died on the cross for uh, as the ultimate struggle and everything. And when you are overcoming something, and when you have faith in God, and it gives you the ability to, in the faith, to go out there and take chances and embrace life, have the hardship, overcome them, that's when you're leading a truly robust life, and you're mm -hmm. getting the most out of it. Mm -hmm. and, and it also brings you closer to God. That's what God likes to see you emulate Jesus. And, uh, and it, it's, so it's not, I, I'm not doing a good job. Oh, yes, you are. <laughs> I'm really impressed. You're doing a great job. There was, there's Preach so much it. more. Yeah. There's so much more to it. And I thought it was absolutely fantastic. Now here's the other side of it is that with these, Oh, we believe in science people. This, this bothers me a lot because actually I've been through these phases is that there's such an arrogance to that. Um, that, 
we uh, most of us know enough now to talk a, a good argument and and believe so much think that we know so much about the world that well you can't have a guy up there on be on those clouds because i've been up there in a plane and he's not there <laughs> you know <laughs> things That's a like good one. that <laughs> so many things like that. and uh but there's so many things that you can't explain from my point of view the older that i get and the more knowledge that I accumulate, the more I realize I don't know, but also the more that I feel uh, and have a have an instinct and an insight and a feeling about my soul and Everything, the interconnectedness yeah. that yes. I have in this world. Uh, so th there's and a lot of this, I, we it could tie right back into our talks about quantum computing and stuff. Maybe that's our ultimate insight. Maybe that's, in my opinion, maybe that is we're building God. That is how we get back to God. We are building that engine to bring them here. Uh, I don't know. But I know that there's a lot. There's more that we don't know than we do know. And But we're just at a... Uh, era in our life. Oh, and he said it like this too. This is the first era in all of civilized man that has ever thought that they can obtain happiness without a transcendent vessel, meaning without a God, whatever your religion is. That's interesting. I don't know how true that is. I was just it's not reading. true. That's the point. It leads yeah. you to anxiety. And he says, when you don't have that God, Jordan Peterson agreed. They both went back and forth. When you don't have that God presence, something higher, a higher power than you, that it will be replaced. And it I will guess be what replaced I was with it'll lead you to little pieces of hell. I, I totally agree with that. I, the part that I didn't agree with, uh, with what he said was that this is the first society that thought they could have happiness without God. Uh, we, we actually have seen that in history before where people thought that they could have that happiness. I was just reading about uh, the history of the French Revolution and how the French Revolution started with the reign of terror <clears throat> and that the reign of terror included getting the king and the queen. Remember Marie? Antoinette let them eat cake uh, they chopped her head off <laughs> yeah they chopped yeah. the king's head off and they chopped everybody's head off and the whole uh, uh, foundation of their official religion the revolution was atheism <clears throat> and after several years of this French revolution they ended up changing their platform and they said that without God life is meaningless and there was sure. no joy in life what it took the joy right out of life and they they could not have happiness to your point perry mm -hmm. and uh, so this has been proven in history actually mm -hmm. and uh, i think what you're saying right now and what you have said about what you've learned especially the part about the more that you learn the more that you you've learned that you don't know right is that is i think a, a big part of where wisdom comes from is is being able to admit that we don't know everything or we don't know a lot of things um and and being able to realize that there is a greater power the bible actually says the beginning of wisdom is the acknowledgement of god yeah i believe that there's a there's a huge power in faith and that again i, I kind of touched on that they talked a lot about it very eloquently about how faith enables you to go out and conquer things that's and, a big point yeah yeah because when you don't have that you're living in, in more fear and negativity and anxiety and what's the point right yeah. i mean there's no there's and no point right. in going out and taking a risk you know what you call that you call that nihilism when you, mm -hmm. when you remove all the, the opposite of anxiety is love. And that's where the faith wow. gets you. That's good, good call. Uh, and I, I've and heard it that enables before. you to move forward. It gives you confidence that God has your back, a higher power. You, and then to put it in a, more of a metaphysical way, if you, if you, even if you don't believe in God, but you believe in a, in a spirituality that, uh, that there's, if you believe that if you think positive thoughts, you, you, you operate on a, a higher vibrational harmony. And there seems to be evidence that that is true. And when you're operating yeah. on a higher vibration, you attract all those good things at that same higher vibration. And that's what faith gets you. So very good, that, Barry. You're better I mean off 
You're better off having faith than, than not. Don't rely on just yourself. You'll be in anxiety. You, you line up uh, with uh, the, the Christian faith in so many ways, yes, Barry. Yes, um, you know, more and more this, so as we go along. Yeah. This, uh, that, this thing that you're talking about, the opposite of faith being fear. And yep. um, a yep. scripture that we were looking at in our Bible study last week, was that last week has to do with um, fear and those that are in fear have not been perfected, perfected in love. And um, if you really think about what you just said is that um, love causes you to overcome fear. And you think about oh, yeah. like, oh, yeah. um, you know, a, a, uh, a mother uh, seeing her child in jeopardy will run out in the middle of, uh, of, 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 you know, traffic or even a gunfight or whatever, and go and save that child without any kind of fear because mm -hmm. pr love perfects you to the point of eliminating fear. Uh, perfect love casts out fear. Yes. It's uh, quite a quite a thing. And so when we look at if we look at the entire world right now, there's a it's a fearful world out there. Mm -hmm. And, um, and what we need to do in order to overcome that fear is to to meditate on that love, and that unconditional love that God has towards you. Mm -hmm. And, you know, really, in the Christian faith, if we know that God has forgiven us for all of our sin, and has has caused us to to be looked at just like his son Jesus then what do we have to fear I mean there's nothing to fear whatsoever if just like we talked about last week if if God says that be of good cheer for I've overcome the world on your behalf then no, it, no matter what happens it's going to have a good outcome um, it's uh, it, it's just destined to happen it, it's uh, uh I was thinking of another scripture and it just disappeared out of my head. But mm. uh, the fact of the matter is we have so many reassurances from God that all things are going to be okay. No matter how it looks, even if you're going through a hard time, ultimately you win, you can operate in joy, not, not just move forward. Like we just talked about, we can move forward in peace and joy at the same time, no matter what we're dealing with. And all we have to do is just focus on that and it just happens. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we are really um, running out of time. Do oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you want to get to some current events or, um, you know, yeah, I, of course, I, I want to talk about a couple of things here. Uh, yeah. Do you see a lot of good frivolous stuff, stuff? Do you see the talk? The ratings plummet as it becomes the lowest rated daytime program as the show returns following Sharon Osbourne's dramatic exit. Yeah, you don't know about that? I don't. I've heard about uh, that had something to do with her being accused of being a bigot. And, because uh, she supported Pierce Morgan. Oh, when, that's right. Who yes. did Pierce Morgan support? It was something frivolous, too. Well, he, he had some. It, this had everything to do with Prince Harry and Meghan Markle. And, oh, um, right. He, and, yeah, he denounced. And they were saying that they, they they were saying that the royal family was was prejudice and right, um, right. and he was saying that's not true the queen is not prejudice and yeah. and so he got fired for that i think <laughs> he, i think he walked thing. off but oh, yeah, uh, he was gonna get fired though but <laughs> so cheryl underwood the one uh on the show that called her oh. a racist uh yeah uh, that was the end of that. Okay, so they're averaging 1.5 million viewers down a whopping 27%. So only 1.5 million viewers. Who's buying advertising that is supporting that show? It's so interesting what you're talking about right now because what How we're about seeing, the Oscars? Yeah, what we're seeing overall is this woke yeah. uh, theme does not attract an audience. Gosh, we had uh, Joe Biden, his whole premise in his speech on Wednesday night was that America is systemically racist. Yeah. And this was the lowest rated first uh, speech of a president. Uh, um, I mean, this he was down 
uh, over 20 million from Trump's speech. That's about half the audience. Uh, Bar Barack Obama's first speech, George Bush's first speech, Clinton's, they all blew away the speech. And it's just that whole woke thing is not driving people. Yeah, people but, don't buy into it. But you know what? Now things are coming full circle here. But yeah, there's enough of the radicals that do buy into it that it perpetuates the fear. So we're right. back to fear again. And fear but, is a powerful force for controlling powerful. large amounts of people. So listen to this real world stuff. So Wednesday, I'm out taking a bike ride after, after work. And I like to go down through Little Italy because then I have to come back up the hill. Kind of get yeah, some yeah. measurement of where I'm at at the beginning the famous, of the season. Uh, the famous hill. Yeah. So yeah. And I stopped it as I uh, do several times a year. It, Lounge Louie. This tiny little, you remember Lounge Louie? It's, it's been I, a long you time. You mean on 6th Street? Uh, no, no, it no, is on okay. Murray Hill. Oh, no, Street, I've never been there. No. Right by Edge Hill, the, the hill that I go up. Yeah. It's a tiny place. I'm usually the only person in there talking to the <laughs> owner. Now, he's a remodeler as well. He does some welding type art. Got the big, long beard like a ZZ Top guy. <laughs> and... Um, so I don't know. It, it, I think he's a nice guy. I, I like talking to him a bit and all that. He goes out of the blue and he goes, I forget what he was talking about. He says, and then there's the, those people. Uh, it kills me to say that, but the Republicans that is probably talking about masks or something, but the hate that came right out of him, this nice guy. So I thought he doesn't know me. And yeah. yeah. And I, I get this, I get this frequently because I'm around the heights and everybody assumes that everybody is far left and it's okay to spout all the far left stuff, but you can't, you know, I'm moderate, man. I'm not a Republican. I'm a registered Democrat, but I don't identify at all with the left. Right. And right. as you know, and I was just amazed by that. So we're back to that fear. So he's buying into it. Right. And, and it's all this hatred. There's so much hatred on the left. The, the whole anti-Trump thing. I hate, oh, we had to bring up his name for the first time this podcast. But <laughs> uh, you know that was so effective and so addictive, and it's so anti-love. I mean, I think we, I think we need some spirituality breathed in to the left. I really do. Well, I think that's the main problem with the left is it's it's actually godless. They they that that that's the difference uh, between the uh, the left and the liberals is that uh, the left is godless. Liberals aren't. Um, and all about I, I, it. Yeah, yeah, religion, and all about it. Yeah. You see, uh, and have you noticed that it seems like liberals are pretty happy people? Yeah, uh, but leftists are seemingly. Angry bitter all the time yeah just hate you know, just vindictive hate full of hate let's, let's yeah. get them i i've got a we'll talk in the next segment here about some of the things that are going on with that uh with this very unequal justice that's happened as a result here we've got two forms of justice one for the left and one for everybody else yeah and um that's that's really happening out there but uh, something you said uh, about this at the beginning <clears throat> This whole uh, this whole hate thing that's happening. I'm I'm really concerned here that uh, uh, the that hatred is uh, permeating our society to the point where I wonder if we'll ever be able to get back to normal. And I too, being a conservative and being black, have that same thing happen to me everywhere I go. Is that people just assume that I'm a Democrat right. and that I believe in this whole Black Lives Matter movement? That that people feel emboldened to come to me and 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 talk in that manner with me as well. And I typically just humor them. Uh, I know. I, I, I never say anything to these people either. Um, I find it like there, it's a little bit sad. I don't mean that to be condescending, but there's an no. ignorance there that they've succumbed to. And it, it's, it's a sad movement. So, well, and I don't need to, um, I, this isn't, it's not up for debate for them. Um, why, Correct. why would I enter into a conversation Correct. like that when all the outcome, I already know what's going to happen. Um, however, I do find it interesting to 
ask neutral questions about how they feel about a certain thing and get them to talk about it. Because what a lot of times happens is they'll talk themselves right out of the idea that they just said to me because it doesn't make any sense. Yeah, that's funny. That's really fun for me. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> I had some notes here. Uh, we'll, we'll wrap up soon. But uh, about the woke dying a slow death, um, the Oscars, uh, this yeah. stuff doesn't interest me at all, but I read a me little neither. bit about it. Yeah. And Anthony Hopkins surprisingly uh, won for best actor. Now, this is all, this. so this is like the worst rated Oscars since, you know, ever. Lot, yeah, like ever. And it was really bad last year. And this one is way worse. And Hopkins didn't even show up. And uh, he, he didn't. And he, I, they caught him on Zoom. Board, right? They caught him on oh, Zoom or something. Yeah. He said, "I had, you know, I he goes, I didn't expect to win." But as I read, uh, they said that he won for his movie Father because it was peaking at the right time. But uh -huh. you see all this other movement about, oh my God, Chadwick Boseman didn't win it. He was the star of the Black Panther who died last year of cancer. And, you know, kind of at the height of the Black Lives Matters movement, right, so they I tied remember. it all in. And so he should have won because he was black and he died. And um, not saying that he didn't give a fantastic performance. As I read, it's, they said that he did. But so they had to go in a long explanation as to why Hopkins won. And it's just it's gotten to a point now. And I remember um those weirdos, uh, Jada Pinkett Smith, Will Smith, uh, they, well, she is always on a tirade about uh, being not at, at the Oscars, not, not enough black people winning. Yes. And stuff. So what right. do we do with that? Do we, do we give black people their own special category to compete against each other? Or no. do we just elevate that if you're black, then you are, you win. No, neither literally. one of those is terrible. That's a, you're right. That's what's happened. And now it's interesting. Um, I didn't watch the, the Oscars either. So I, I, I'm, I'm surprised not. they don't have riots going on because this guy didn't win. Uh, you know, it, it, this is the thing is that uh, it, it's gotten to the point where you can't tell if the person that won won because of their quality work or because of the color of their skin. Yeah. And, you know, the, the sad world when we're judged by the color of our skin, it was a uh, it was Tim Scott um, that said that um, the policies of the administration today are bringing us back to a time where we're judged by the color of our skin oh. rather than the content of our character. And I mean, this is, we're being hammered by that left and right now yeah. that it's the color of your skin that counts when just divided. It, it was very, I mean, for most of my life, the goal has always been to judge people by the content of their character. And that's, that's the world that I want to live in. Yeah, I don't want to have anything given to me because I'm black. I will, I, I, in, in fact, I really believe that's the racist thing is oh, yeah. that you have to give me something because I'm not competent enough to do it for myself. I mean, well, that put. is just wrong and it's racist and people, I know there are a lot of people that have that attitude that are not racist. They actually have very good intentions. And I, and I love that they have a good heart. They've just been deceived by this narrative that yeah. says that it's a good thing to pity these people that have these certain characteristics. It it's gets wrong. to our guilt. It gets to our guilt. And it is guilt. We, we want a virtue it's signal. Manipulating we're, not, guilt. we're not one of them. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's manipulative. It's, mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's manipulating people by using shame and guilt. And as we've talked about the very first thing the devil does in the Bible is he manipulates Adam and Eve using shame. And mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's, that's obviously that must be his number one weapon and look yeah. at what's happened to our society. We live in a shame society now. There we go. So additionally with the Oscars, I remember reading that uh, at least two Asian directors won. See, and, that's it. Yep. And, and now you got to ask yourself, you know, oh, because now all of a sudden we're talking about Asian and Asian yep. hate and blah, 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 because it works in the media well. 
and for this, yeah, all it. these same reasons. Now the shame of it, and I think I honestly, honestly think Asians have been overlooked. Um, oh, we yeah. haven't talked about them forever, and I mean in a positive way because they're hugely positive contributors to our society. Now and we have to wait and start talking about them in, in a negative way, like there's all this racism. Uh, about them uh, so now they win and you got to wonder how tainted that is is it or is yeah, it not now we don't know it's the same thing it's like did they win because they're asian or yeah. did this guy win because he's black and it's yeah. too bad because now it's taken away the value of the actual oscar so what yeah. you want an oscar well, you know i mean this is the thing is that as a black man now if I'm given an award or I, I win something in the back of my mind, I got a question, wait a second, yeah. did they just give that to me because I'm black? Yeah. Uh, and so it takes away, it takes away your self-worth. This is, it's a terrible thing that we're implementing, that we're foisting on our public right now. And because it's purposeful. It our dignity. It takes away our dignity. It's purposeful. It is purposeful. To keep us divided. Yeah. That's exactly right. And, and I don't want to talk about it. Here. I wanted to bring yeah. up that point. Yeah, that's I a, don't, that is a yeah, good point, we, though. We had more important subjects that we talked about for the first hour. Yeah, you're right. But this is something that's impacting the whole world right now. And, and we need something that we need to be able to talk we about. We need to wake up to it. Is yeah, what it you're right. You're and right. I think I, most I, I of us are. Most of us are. I think the way to take this back is in numbers. Um, we've got to, uh, the, the government's not going to unite us. We've That's got a to have a grassroots program of people like you and me that just go out there and we've got way more as the citizens here in this country, we have way more in common than anything else. And um, I'm, I know one thing is that if each of us would just love on the neighbor in front of you, uh, behind you, on this either side of you, that would change the entire, if everybody did that, this entire country would change overnight. And if we could just find the fact that we are fellow, we, we are all of the same race. It's the human race. And we have to look out for one another and we need to help each other. And we need to fight against this uh, theft of our liberties and our freedoms and, and, um, and, and take those things back. Uh, you brought up the, the whole science thing earlier, uh, God and science. And I wanted to get back to that because God invented science. He's the original scientist. There's no conflict between God and science, not whatsoever. So let's get real about this. Let's look at the real facts and the real science and, and let's be real with each other. And let's take our lives back. And in order to do that, we need to unify. And with that, I say those are perfect parting words. Perfect. And we're going to put a cap on this and go right into the after show. Thanks a lot, everybody. Hey, give us a like, give us a share, look us up on your podcast app, and uh, please leave us a review there. Go to over50startingover.com, sign up for our email list, get all this with our show notes and links in your email box as it happens. See you all next week. <laughs>